come with us on a journey into the unknown, the unexplained, and the unbelievable. We will test your senses and challenge your beliefs. A world where science and religion clash. Or do they? You will meet real people and hear real stories, but you will not believe. You will witness strange sights and hear strange sounds, but you will not believe. This is the New England Ghost Project. Welcome to the Nightmare. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another exciting hour of Ghost Chronicles Next Generation, right here on East Bridgewater's famous television station. I am Ron Kovic, your host, and joining me today is my lovely co-host, the blind bombshell herself, Miss Ann Carrigan. Oh, hello, everybody. Now that we did a great big mic test, he's going to talk like this, right? The director is cursing him right now. But anyways, hi, everybody. <laughs> Who doesn't curse me? <laughs> every day of the week, every day of the week. If I don't have people cursing me, I'm not doing my job. That's, That's the way I look at this it. That's true, you know? 100%. God true. put me on this earth for one thing, and that was to irritate people. <laughs> <laughs> and I do a damn good job you at it. You certainly do. Thank you. So speaking about that, did you see the ghost in my glass? Oh, I mean, yeah, well, they're not going to see it because it's so uh, close. Yeah, but you we don't want to see the ghost. We had a miraculous event happening at uh, Spirit Quest this past weekend. Uh, out of the clear blue, just like that, a ghost's image appeared on my portly glasses. And there it is. And there were numerous pictures taken because yes. people were astonished by it. Did they see the Virgin Mary there too? Not quite. No. Not quite. No. Jesus? No. Nope. No. Nope. So I figured this must be my spirit guide. <laughs> so I will never wash these glasses again. Uh, yeah. So my spirit guide can be Cause, seen. Because, you know, right, he, he could barely see where he was going before, and now he's got a big smudge on his glasses. I don't need he's to got see. two eyes. I don't it. need to see. This is true. I am clear audience. <laughs> I am one. If you've ever driven with him, you know he doesn't see. I am one so. with the wor world, and the world is one with me. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. So what have you been up to? Scientifically speaking, of course. Yeah. What have you been up to besides getting skeletons on your glasses? It's not skeletons. Or ghosts? That's my spirit ghosts. guide. So we, we've your been spirit a, guide. Yeah, we've had a fun-filled adventure, S Steve and I. Yeah. We have. Yeah, we, we went to all the fabulous previously used places. <laughs> Salvation Army, Goodwill. And got some astonishingly <laughs> fabulous previously Ooh, used items. I can't wait to see. Are they haunted? I don't think so. Not this time around. No? But anyways, uh, I do believe that we have a cemetery. Because I, I want to I get right to our guest because he's, he's traveled 6,000 miles to come here. Yes, we have yeah. a great guest tonight. Yes. So, yes, we have a cemetery tripping this month. I know, I know, I haven't done a cemetery tripping. You've all been dying and missing it. So, tonight we have a cemetery tripping for you. So, if we could roll that, Russ. Welcome to Cemetery Tripping, where I will feature a different cemetery in each episode that I hope you will seek out and enjoy as much as I do. As an avid taphophile, or lover of tombstones, I spend a lot of time in the local New England area in the beautiful and historic cemeteries we have here. The stones here are like no others, and I have literally thousands of pictures of the intricate and symbolic carvings found on them. You can see my pictures on Facebook by doing a search for Cemetery Tripping. Today we're visiting Riverview Cemetery in Groveland, Massachusetts. I was recently at the annual Spirit Quest Paranormal Conference in Groveland, Mass, and happened upon this enormous and wonderful cemetery just a few miles from the venue. Of course, being pressed for time during this busy weekend, I was only able to photograph a small section of the cemetery. However, this corner contained some of the oldest graves, which of course had the best carvings. Riverview dates from 1782 and has many lovely carvings, ranging from the Puritan death head, sole effigies of the late 1700s, to Victorian willows and urns, angels and weeping widows. I was immediately impressed by the beautiful willow and urn motifs, which were obviously by the same carver in many instances. 
with flowing lines and what I would describe as a dappled background. I noticed the same background with many of the portrait stones. There were also some simpler willow carvings, which were almost like folk art, which were equally as nice with their simple, clean lines. I came across a series of footstones for the Kimball Hopkinson family, which all bore a coffin-like inscription. I've never seen this on footstones, which tend to be generally unadorned except for a name or initials. The actual gravestones all had a form of death's head, which I like to call aliens, due to their oval head shapes. This is not the official name, by the way. And they also contained hexafoil type designs. Three stones which had incredible examples of Victorian carvings were those of John G. Brown, Thomas Savory, and Edna Parker. John G. Brown's marker is engraved with a stunning angel with flowing robes, pointing upwards and carrying the scales of justice. She is one of the seven virtues, justice. This was exciting to me because I seldom see this particular virtue in the cemetery. This carving would lead me to believe that John Brown was somehow employed in or associated with the legal profession. The marker is also adorned with grapes and grape leaves, which represent Christ and the Christian faith. The grave of Thomas Savory literally stopped me in my tracks. It has very ornate carvings of a winged serpent or a caduceus, which indicates an association with the medical field. Although I knew what it was, the first thought that popped into my head was dragon. <laughs> a large urn is flanked by weeping willows with a column to the left and a grieving widow to the right. Finally, Edna Parker's tombstone is resplendent with sunflowers, thistle, and a large soul effigy and stands almost as tall as me. The sunflowers mean a life fulfilled, the thistle, earthly sorrow, Christ's crown of thorns, and Scotland as country of origin. It also bears the saying, memento mori, which means remember thy death. The soul effigy is the gentler successor to the grim death's head, both basically meaning the soul's ascension to heaven on angel wings. A famous burial in the cemetery is Civil War Congressional Medal of Honor recipient Frank M. Whitman. He served as a sergeant in the Union Army during the Civil War and was awarded the Medal of Honor as a private in Company G, 35th Massachusetts Infantry, for action on September 17, 1862, at Antietam, Maryland. His citation reads, was among the last to leave the field at Antietam and was instrumental in saving the lives of several of his comrades at the imminent risk of his own. At Spotsylvania was foremost in line in the assault where he lost a leg. His marker is a large obelisk with the Medal of Honor carved on the top. I have vowed to return to Riverview at my earliest opportunity and when I have a lot of time so I can explore the rest of it. So if you are planning a visit, give yourself at least a few hours to stroll through, read the stones, and enjoy the carvings. Happy cemetery tripping. Wow. Like that, huh? That's awesome. Did you like that dragon? I, that's, is that <laughs> what it was? Yeah. <laughs> Not a dragon, but it looks like it when you walk up on it. The, the Game of Thrones stone. The Game of Thrones stone. But anyways, yeah, that was very good, Anne. I'm, I'm Fabulous cemetery. I'd love to see that myself. I'm going by it, but I've never been in. Yeah. Well, the way that the GPS brought me to Spirit Quest this time brought mm. me out to Newburyport um, yeah. and all the historic homes, and I had never been. I'd never, I'd never come that way before, so it was uh, pretty good. Awesome. Pretty good so anyways, we do have a, uh, a guest with we us do. tonight. We yeah. do. And uh, he is someone who's traveled great distance to come here. Mm -hmm. He is okay. the uh, founder of Parascience. He's a member of the SBR, the Society for Psychical Research, a uh, advisor to the Ghost Club. This thing. I like looking at you. Look at this thing. <laughs> A bobblehead. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. I do that. I, 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 you know, I, you got me too far up. See, I can't see you, so it drives me. No, you got the camera set. No, we can't. Look at that set. camera. All right. I know that. All right. You introduce him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Parsons. Thank you both very much. You're I was welcome. actually enjoying the cemetery tripping more. <laughs> can we, can we run another one? 
Sure, we can play Very them all cool. night for you. Very cool. Thank you. Because, as you know, we, we have some cemeteries back home. Oh, you have some um, lovely cemeteries. Mm -hmm. I, you, you really would love to. They might be a little old in an hour, I think. Uh, a couple centuries. Maybe. Yeah. There's some of them, yeah. The, I think the oldest one locally has headstones dating back to the 10th century. Oh, my God. But most of them are, I mean, the mo a lot of them are recent, of course. Yeah. But are they legible? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Well, bucket list. I'd love to show you around. All right. I'll take that as an invitation. <laughs> uh -huh. Steve's like, damn. No, <laughs> more than welcome. More than welcome. So she's, he, that means he's paying for your trip. Oh, yep. even better. Because when you say uh, it's an invitation, then that means Brits oh, consider really? that as that oh. you want them over there and yep, they're paying for your trip and all that stuff. That. He's the one who told me about <laughs> it. I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything about the Brits. I, I'm just a poor old New England boy from Poland. Mm. So there you go. Upstart colonial. Yeah, upstart colonial. Anyway, so Steve, as I as I mentioned in his intro, has uh, recently um, been involved with. No, he's always been involved with the SBR, but recently he was uh, commissioned by them to do a, a fabulous new um, book for them, which is the the Guidance Notes. And you want to tell us a little bit about that, Steve, how that came about? Uh, how it came about is the realization that the Society for Psychical Research, which has been around since 1882, had published a series of uh, notes of guidance for people who investigate the paranormal, predominantly hauntings and apparitions, those sort of phenomena. And uh, the last edition was published in 1968 which means that uh, it was somewhat out of date. It had some great lines like, if, for example, you, uh, you suspect the witness of perpetuating a hoax upon you, then you sit them in a chair, you put a light-proof cloth bag over their head, <laughs> and you tie their hands lightly behind their back with some black cotton thread. Mm -hmm. Now, bagging and tying is frowned upon. <laughs> yeah, we st we still do that, you know, because we follow the original guidance notes. I, I mean, we've Backing we've got we've mm -hmm. got to stop and do that now. We have to bring. Yeah. Well, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of the information is was still hasn't really changed since mm -hmm. um, uh, the first edition was 1955, and then of course we've got the famous Harry Price uh, Blue Book, which is in 1937. Mm. But I also realised that paranormal investigating is. There's a community of around 12, 15,000 in the UK, around 200,000 in the USA. Oh, my God. Many of whom hadn't heard of the SPR and didn't know what they did. Oh. But more, most importantly, didn't realize that the SPR was such a valuable resource to them, that they have uh, all of uh, 150 years of examining these subjects. And they have a, an archive and a library, and they're freely available. There's no charge. But though I also equally realized that the SPR had sort of drawn up, pulled up the drawbridge and withdrawn into uh, its ivory towers <laughs> and wasn't outreaching to the ghost hunting community. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the, you know, from both sides because uh, there are some strange practices that you see in haunted houses being used by investigators. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. Paranormal kitties and <laughs> various ghost boxes and, and such. So in 2016, I'm not rising to the camera. <laughs> He's got a name. All right. Um, yeah. Um, in 2016, I attended the SPR conference where I, I presented a paper entitled What Have the Romans Ever Done for Us? <laughs> which harangued the Society for Psychical <laughs> Research for being the domain of parapsychologists and anybody else that wants to wear corduroy. <laughs> and, and said that you are just failing the community. You are making no effort whatsoever to reach out to them and to tell them that you exist and to tell them that you are a, a, a resource for them. Mm -hmm. And equally, I harangued the ghost hunting community for not picking up a book and not making themselves aware that there was 150 years of ghost hunting before they showed up. Right. Um, the upshot being, they said, well, what should we do? Well, I'd already made some suggestions about what to do, about including, well, we need to sort this guidance notes out which is now so horribly out of date <laughs> that we can't go and bag and tie witnesses, however tempting it might be. <laughs> um, 
There wasn't a line of thought. I was very tempted to put a line about you can electrocute mediums, <laughs> but that wasn't allowed either. So they said, OK, you've got the job. Uh, so for the next, I thought it would be a relatively straightforward job to write. Because the, the commission was about 40 pages. And I thought, well, that's going to take me a couple of months. It took me over a year wow. because one thing leads to another. And you, I, I, one thing I was very, very careful, conscious and careful about is I didn't want it to be uh, come across as you must do this. You, you must. This is the way, the only way that you can do it. Because that wasn't what the SPR we're saying what the SPR is saying here are some good guidelines for good practice if you follow these guidelines and devo develop them into your own investigations then your evidence and the quality of your investigation will raise up mm -hmm. and then you can produce evidence that will challenge the parapsychologists and the skeptics like Joe Nickel and Chris French and others so it's about upping the game so it, the hardest part was to write them in such a way as to be encouraging rather than authoritarian. So seven, a year or so later and 75 pages, <laughs> the SPR published it and it's, it sold through its first print run, which is encouraging. That's awesome. Uh, it's uh, very encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a hard sell in some instances. Um, before the, as the book was released, uh, the SPR obviously ran some small publicity for it on social media. And one of the very first comments was, who do the hell do the SPR think they are? Just because they've been going 150 years <laughs> doesn't give them the right to tell me what to do. Really? By a man whose job was to drive a bus all day. Okay. So it's a hard sell in some areas. And people jump to the conclusion, that conclusion. Yeah. That they're telling us what to do. Without no, ever their guidelines. Reading. Yeah. To help you. And this was something, I mean, to he'd, help you. he'd oh never yeah. read it because it hadn't yet been published. Oh. So, so that was just the yeah. first knee jerk, knee -jerk reaction. reaction yeah. right. it's, a, it's a really good uh, guideline. So I've read portions of it, and uh, some of the procedures and, and things that they suggest are, are, are really good uh, guidance for paranormal groups and what things they actually really should be doing anyway in order to a proper investigation and I mean you have to <laughs> the people who invest who are investigating mm -hmm. like when I started I had no clue mm -hmm. I was watching TV mm -hmm. so this is how you do it this is, this is and how they're, you do they're an investigation. in and that's why I harangued the SPR because 30 years ago if a case came to the attention of the newspaper they would almost automatically phone the society. The society would then send investigators along. Mm -hmm. What happens now is that they phone the local ghost group and we have over 900 of them in the UK. <laughs> These, and what you get is a, it's a bag of dolly mixtures. It's a random assortment of who you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. You get, you know, you get the psychics, you get the, sci the, what, the scientists, the pseudo-scientists, the ones in the middle, the crazies, the crazies. And, the d and the dangerous. We'll come down. You know, I, there are some uh, horrific stories of people who rock up at, you know, I'll sort your ghost out for you. Mm -hmm. And what the society, because the society had withdrawn, because they had become predominantly academic, that they'd shifted away from haunted houses and spontaneous cases, more towards academic parapsychology. And that had resulted in a vacuum. People who were starting, like yourself, your, their only resource for them was the TV show and social media. So it wasn't surprising that bad practice started to spread from the TV shows, where they would don their ghost fighter's uniform and go out and do mortal combat with the evil possessing demon. <laughs> they, they didn't have the resource. We did an interview. Uh, not so very long ago, where we asked the leader of a UK paranormal team called Para-X, uh, Paranormal X, who has over 20,000 followers on Facebook. Have you heard of the SPR? And he said, I've heard of them. 
What do, do you know what they do? No, I don't. Now that's, I, I guess I'm kind of fortunate because when I grew up the, uh, and started ghost hunting, there was, no so, there was no social media and there was no ghost hunting television shows. So I had to go to the local library and dig through books and find another book and another book and figure it out for yourself. But you were basing it on the work of Hans Holzer, Peter Underwood, Harry Price. So you were getting relatively good information. And like with the guidance notes, I then developed that information. The guidance notes are not a you must do. They are just simply a some suggestions, some guidance. It's it's a smallish book. It's designed that you can chuck it in the oh. kit bag, yeah, you know, next to Paranormal it. Kitty and <laughs> the the SLS camera and the Frank's box it and. Up I, Kitty. Yeah. I do have a soft he spot for. I do camera. have a soft spot. Ron tried to make me bring the cat down. I can't believe you didn't bring Paranormal Kitty. No. No. So he's not mine. He's only going on vacation he's going to the UK. He's going to visit the UK. He's going to visit the UK. But so we've given him a name now. What's the paranormal kitty's name? Kitty Bits. Kitty Bits. <laughs> kitty Bits. Because he has no bits. So <laughs> and the on-off switch is in a very precarious spot <laughs> under the tail. So but the story, can we talk about paranormal kitty well just for a moment? Well, before you do that, then okay. you, you really no. have to explain what paranormal kitty is if you're going to do that. That's what but I was just going to do. Okay, exactly what it is, I mean. Yeah. Okay, fine. So Paranormal Kitty. Uh, kitty Bits. Kitty Bits. Kitty Bits. Is, <laughs> a, looks like a stuffed cat. It's like a toy. Because it is. But it, it <laughs> is. Uh, but it has an EMF meter in it. So uh, if you're doing paranormal investigations, <laughs> if you have an EMF meter, it lights up with, you know, the electric electrical <laughs> charge made by the spirits, uh, or the plugs in the walls, or somebody's cell phone. Uh, but so paranormal kitty is kind of like it's like it's meant to be a trigger object, mm. right? Go uh, ghost bait. Ghost bait. It's ghost bait. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost draws I nearer, and kitty's <laughs> collar like well, kept, you see, the nose goes first. Yeah. And then the lights go around the collar. The collar. The mm -hmm. ears or the paws, mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. No. Just the collar. Just the collar. So. Uh, and it meows. Meow, <laughs> meow. It's terrifying. So Paranormal Kitty was uh, gifted to Steve. Loaned. Loaned to Steve. I think she gifted it to you. Well, it started a year ago, didn't it? Yes. She, uh, yeah, she brought she it along. She, uh, uh, our good friend Sand Sandra. Sandy had brought it at uh, a Paracon. Mm -hmm. and she'd brought it along, and I was immediately both baffled, puzzled, intrigued, and <laughs> amused, and I fell in love with the thing. <laughs> and I kind of adopted it for the whole of uh, Spirit Quest. Yes, yeah. And had to give, give up Paranormal Kitty. Aww. And over the past year, while I've been back in the UK, I've kept in regular contact with Kitty Bits. Really? Kitty I've, had, I've had regular photos and updates. That's wonderful. And... Uh, Friday, first night at Spirit Quest, Sandy was gracious enough to bring Kitty Bits to see me Aww. and uh, allow, uh, allowed Kitty Bits to stay with me for the weekend. Aww. And then on the final day, um, decided that, uh, that Kitty Bits could come to the UK for a, a vacation. That's fabulous. I think the final straw was when he showed up with the cat carrier. <laughs> he had a cat carrier. I have a picture of it. Not yes, cat carrier, vaccination so certificates, <laughs> uh, U UK quarantine so certificates, all done. That is the story of Paranormal Kitty, a.k.a. Kitty Bits. Kitty Bits. And uh, there's a lot of these different trigger objects. Uh, we had mm -hmm. a Raggedy Ann for one, not that I did with your group, but with uh, the, uh, the granny, mm -hmm. Paranormal Granny. They have teddy bears. They have, yeah, they have teddy Boo bears. Boo Bear, $299 for Boo Blow Bear. Blow up dolls. Oh my God. That, let's not go there. So at any rate. So I thought we might see Paranormal Kitty tonight. But we did encounter another one last night at the Red Light Seance, a new one. Oh, what's that? Uh, a new variant of the ghost box. Uh, one of the participants at the Red Light Seance had turned up last night with this uh, box. And it's got some radio dials and a digital display, and mm -hmm. it's got uh, a plasma ball 
you know, these plasma discs okay. that shoot blue lightning around uh -huh. um, in the front of it. It was 350 bucks. <gasps> oh my God. I know. And, no and the instructions were absolutely, I mean, there were no instructions. For $350, you got the box mm -hmm. and a photocopied sheet of paper. That didn't, ex so the person that bought it didn't know how it worked. They hadn't, wow. it hadn't been explained, the instructions didn't explain it. And I thought, you know, at first I thought we, we weren't sure it wasn't, it, it was malfunctioning or it was broken or it was whatever. Anyway, uh, whilst the seance was on and we had some quiet time, I, I figured it out, rewrote some instructions. <laughs> uh, so I wrote him a new set of instructions and then gave him a quick lesson on it. Uh, but basically, it's uh, an SPS 7 spirit box mm -hmm. uh, with a guitar echo chamber, a guitar effects pedal echo chamber attached to the back of it. That's what's inside. And a plasma disc. And a plasma disc. Yeah. Yeah. 350 wow. bucks. Speaking about the seance last night, I wanted to give a shout out to somebody who listens to our show uh, she actually doesn't listen to radio. She listens to the Ghost Chronicles radio podcast. And you think I could remember her name? Oh, Ron. Well, should I, can Write I give a shout down. out to one of our international listeners? Oh, absolutely. Steve. Trish Alexander, if you're listening in Australia, good Hi, day. Trisha. Good day. <laughs> good day? Yeah. yeah. Good day. So good day. She we do have listeners show. anyway, so just oh, well, let you know. Your shout out will. You'll have to think on it. It'll come to you. I doubt it. No? No. It's a name. I can't remember names. Like, how, how, well, <laughs> just before we were talking about the cemetery in Portsmouth, I went through 12 Ps and I still <laughs> couldn't get it. I know it began with a P and that was it. Well, now you're just doing your job again because... Can't you get medication? Whoever she is, she's going to be mad at you because you forgot no, her name. No, no. I'm sure no. you can get medication. She actually likes, can't the, she likes the show because of me, so there you go. All right. Must be my boyish charm. This absolutely. Yeah, is. it's got to be it, right? No, yeah, I can't look at you. I can't look at you. Oh, drinks. Can't look at me. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. On the, also, on the way down, we we realized that um, this is my seventh visit to Spirit Quest. Oh, it's also my seventh visit to East Bridgewater TV. Really? I was on the very first show. Yes, you were. With Doctor. How many Ka shows? Doctor, Doctor Callum Cooper. How many Do How many shows have we done? Well, this would be. This is our, we're going into our sixth year. Sixth year. Sixth year. I've done seven. I must have done. You, I, I don't uh -oh. know. I must have you done. You can't do more shows I than we had. I think you can only be here for if six times. Yeah, <laughs> you can't be here. <laughs> well, if I was here with Cal and his friend. <laughs> yes. Nori. Yeah, I don't say, oh. Yeah, we need a crucifix before we mention that. Nori. Um, then that was seven years ago. I don't know. Don't look at me. <laughs> go back I can't the remember diary. yesterday. I have to go back through the diary and check. <laughs> well, all I know is... By the number of shows that we've done, right? Yeah, this yeah. is show number 67. But Cal this is evening, now doctor. So doctor. Well, when, ah. you, Double when, doctor. when you think about it, well, 67, Ian, that's... Uh, we've missed a couple yeah, along the way. we've missed a few. Five, five and a half years? I swear it is. All right, I I mean, I'm sure I'm sure our listeners don't really give her hoots. <laughs> so uh, why, don't we move on, why don't we move we've on to uh, something? We've lost time. Yeah, time, time slip. Left. Yeah, time, time slip. So why don't we move on to something okay, that's more intriguing than, than that? And uh, Steve has a a, a a presentation come up. In fact, it, it's in this area, I believe, uh, Friday, which yes. is uh, when ghosts attack. Mm -hmm. and where is that in? Uh, it's going to be this Friday night, October 4th, at Jamie's Pub Ooh, I in like that Whitman, place. Massachusetts. Starts at 7. You get tickets at the door. And we're going to have, that includes pizza and salad and Mr. Parsons' awesome talk. And when they have some ghost raffles. attack. When ghosts attack. Mm. So it'll be fun, spooky way. Start off your It's strictly for the Halloween adults as well. Season. It is? Yes. The talk is 18. strictly uh -oh. a... No, uh, no, no minors for the talk unless they're it's rated R. Or if you're easily offended, <laughs> rated R for Ron. Oh, all right. Well, I may have to reach out to somebody that asked me uh, and tell them it's not to bring it's their it's fourteen year old. No, no, no. It's well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Poss possibly not a fourteen year old. If she's okay. got the money, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing. There is nothing too terrible. That was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> there is yes. nothing too terrible. Yes. Mm. All right. Okay. Just kidding. 
Steve goes home, when rewrite ghosts, speech. No. Yeah. no. <laughs> when ghosts attack. Retract, retract, redact, no, redact, redact. No, never, never, <laughs> never redact. I have a question uh, to get back to the SPR. Mm -hmm. If I called up the SPR, mm -hmm. and I was in England, mm -hmm. and, and I said, I have a haunting, what happens? What's the process? What do they do? Right, what they would, uh, the point of contact, normally the secretary, Mm -hmm. would immediately pass it to one of the members of the Spontaneous Cases Committee. Okay. We have like a first response group of four people. Oh, God, no. The, those people have uh, a standard... Get into no. get into the things! So. We've got a live one! <laughs> they also Stop. live several you know, hundred miles apart. There's mm -hmm. one to cover each part mm -hmm. of the UK. Okay. That person has a a standardized package of uh, e equipment, so it would be a, there's a camera, recorder, uh, still camera, and some basic environment monitoring equipment. Paranormal right. kitty. But that person who's nearest would then make contact with you, if you, if you were the, the, and arrange to, well, first of all, over the phone, decide if we could do anything at all. Okay. Because often the situation, the circumstances are not Right. conducive to an investigation. So if Ann called up and says, I got demons coming out my ears, can you help me? You would make a judgment call on the re what, how reliable you think the person is right. or whether or how big the demons you. were. If, if, you, if you think that, uh, yeah, this sounds, they sound reasonable and plausible and they're not just pulling your chain, mm -hmm. then you would arrange to meet them and you would, with them, um, decide what do they want to do because we don't go in and say, uh, we will do an investigation, we will do this, oh yes, you've got one of those. What we say to them is, these are your options. Um, do you want us to do an investigation? Because it, it's led very much by the client. Okay, that's good to know. And collaboratively, at every step with them, they are the lead person throughout. Mm -hmm. And they are, we call it a process of informed consent. We lay out the options and then we go through them and they choose the option. All right. And that could lead to an investigation, that could lead to a walk away, that could lead to uh, a constant dialogue over, uh, so they can maintain a sort of, I have a question, so they have somebody they can uh, ask a question of, or if the, there are changes and developments at the location, someone to speak to, or we could go straight back in. So th the options are many and varied and are individual to every single call that comes in. Do you have a reveal at the end? Only to the client because they're the only person to whom we're answerable. Okay. We have a question from the chat room. We do. Is there any way to convince Ron and Ann, convince Ron and Ann to go, to, to, the go to the UK, UK with, with Steve. Steve? Thank you, John. <laughs> That's from John in our chat room. <laughs> oh, and my glass, and my me. glasses are smudged. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, mm. I know. I just need, I need a. a I can read. I need the writing to be a little bigger. <laughs> anyway, you don't have to convince me. I'll go. Mm -hmm. I'll I think you'd be most, I most got, welcome. Got my but it's guess. not like we're short of haunted places. Right. Really. So also, now. The SPR, mm -hmm. if it was a legit, you felt there was a, a legitimate haunting and there was something really, you know, amazing going mm -hmm. on here. You wouldn't just go in once. Absolutely not. You would you wouldn't, you know, go there and spend less than twenty four hours there and then make a decision. There are, th I, c I can't imagine the scenario where there would be a one-shot deal investigation. Unless there was nothing there whatsoever and it was and just... Uh, no, no, not even under those, because it would take more than once to determine there was nothing there anyway. Right. Exactly. Uh, but it might be due so to circumstances... So if you went and you found out that they were cuckoo? Well, there was, there was, the, wa the only one-shot uh, investigation I can think of is because the building was being demolished the next day. That ah. works. <laughs> that works. Ah. <laughs> that is literally the only ah. one. We would always negotiate to look at the the situation over the longest possible period of time mm -hmm. but we would focus entirely at first on when are they when did they have their experience so if it was eight o'clock in the evening we wouldn't go at midnight 
if it was during the day we wouldn't go after dark mm -hmm. and we, you start with what we know so we start with what the witness has told us uh, about their experience and what we're, we're, we're trying to do is not debunk but understand so we try to understand what happened to them now that might be uh, by using uh, our, our own investigators in the same situation to see if they too have similar experiences. It might be, for example, if the events were audible, they heard something, then we could validate that uh, and objectify it by using sound recorders. Uh, we certainly wouldn't deploy a truckload of equipment uh, <laughs> from the off. We would only measure... You wouldn't bring the fish truck in? No. <laughs> we would only ever measure uh, what was required. So if they said it got colder or warmer, then you have a reason to measure temperature. If they said they heard footsteps, you would naturally uh, monitor the sound. You would also monitor vision with sound as well. Because sound on its own, if you have a sound recording of what sounds like footsteps, mm -hmm. you need vision to demonstrate the there was nobody there, right. or it wasn't one of your team or somebody, the janitor walking through. Uh, or if it was an apparition, we could use uh, video uh, and still photography. We would never, the, S the SPL doesn't own full spectrum and SLS cameras for a very good reason. Because if the witness says, hey, I saw an apparition, then they saw them with their own eyes in the visual spectrum. That's true. They didn't see an infrared Ultra or ultraviolet and right. um, we would also measure some esoteric or more unusual uh, n natural phenomena such as very low frequency sound we would also look at the electromagnetic spectrum as well right. if we felt it was necessary right. S the SBR has been around for a few years mm -hmm. So you must have had some interesting cases can oh. you care to share some of the, your more interesting cases I with us I think Everybody will be aware of the Enfield poltergeist, which took place in the late 1970s. The one the Warrens investigated? That's the one that was actually, ba well, <laughs> it, was the, it was the one that was used as the basis of the Conjuring 2 movie. Ah. The Warrens' involvement uh, is very different than is portrayed in Conjuring 2. In fact, the lead investigator, one of the pair of lead investigators for the Enfield Poltergeist case was Morris Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair. Now Morris, uh, both are sadly now dead, but I uh, still got messages for him on Twitter. Good, yeah. uh, but Guy Playfair in Underwood too yeah. became he had nothing to do with it. Playfair became a Guy Playfair became a very good friend of mine, and I was given uh, the opportunity to quit. And we talked about it on a number of occasions. Indeed, we had him as a guest on Ghost Chronicles International, and we asked him. What was Ed and Lorraine Warren's involvement with the Enfield poltergeist? And he said on one day they were uh, in the house during the day making some recordings and there came a knock at the door. Guy being the nearest, he opened the door and there stood an American whom he didn't know. And he said, my name's Ed Warren. We could make thousands off this. Oh, God. Guy thanked him uh, politely and shut the door. <coughs> that... And Guy says that you know, uh, the Warrens never set foot in the building. What's oh. very bizarre about the whole thing is that we know for a fact, because we've got the SPR have got the full documented archive of hundreds and hundreds of hours of recordings and interviews and transcripts, that the Warrens didn't set foot in the house. <laughs> Yet when the Conjuring 2 movie was trailing, they did an interview with one of the children now grown up mm -hmm who, on camera, thanked the Warrens as being the only people who, could, who were there and were listening and were helpful and who were able really? to sort the problem of the Enfield poltergeist out. Huh. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Very, very strange interview to see. Mm -hmm. um, not, not unusual in, the, in, the, in terms of psychical research because, of course, the Fox sisters, also for a fee, um, they redacted their claims and said that they were clicking their toes and then changed their mind later. Okay. So. We have another question. Can you read it? Yes, I, this is nice and big. Is okay. the haunting by Cole 
daunting, real or fiction? Daunting? Not familiar with that. Are you? Oh, The Haunting. Is it The Haunting movie? Mm. Could be referring to... The you can just say it. Oh, by Donald Sutherland? Oh, the movie The Haunting. Oh. oh, okay. It's very loosely based on a number of cases all sort of stitched together. You know, he's the parapsychologist and he brings his student uh, ghost or parapsychologist along to a big haunted mansion. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, a mishmash of several cases. There are lots of uh, places that claim to be the inspiration for The Haunting. Mm -hmm. And, and there's also been a remake of it, mm -hmm. um, but no, it's not. F it, it's not based on any any one particular case. It's actually based on a sort of melding of bits of lots of different cases. That's my favorite. I want to get back to the Enfield poster guys because basically you just didn't really tell anything about it. You just said the warrants weren't there. What was well, that was the, the most important part. Not <laughs> the warrants. Not, not to there. our listeners. What, what, they, what they would there. like to know is is what. Uh, <coughs> what really occurred there and, and what the case was in itself. Well, I don't want to give a huge amount away because they would have to come to the Wyndham next Monday uh -huh. to right. hear the talk entitled The Most Haunted House in the World. Essentially, this uh, in, in this quiet, leafy suburb of North London, there was an ordinary brick-built terraced property. And in it lived a mother, her two daughters, and there were two sons. The father, there'd, there'd been difficulties and the father, had, they had separated and the father had nothing to do with it. There were also some health issues with one of the, the boys. And he lived away uh, from the home for parts of the year. Uh, events started quietly enough, as they often do, with scratchings and objects starting to move, which accelerated very rapidly into much larger um, movement of objects, noises. The first witnesses were in fact two police constables who were called on the very first night. And whilst they were there, they both witnessed uh, a chair, a, uh, a normal heavy chair with four, four legs, no wheels, move itself right across one of the rooms. Hmm. There were other events such as uh, one of the children managed to levitate through a wall and appear uh, floating past next door's bedroom window, the other side of the, because the houses had joined. And it had over the course of it, the, the, the whole uh, series of events lasted about nine months. And almost from within a week of them starting, the, society, the SPR investigators uh, were visiting. Mm -hmm. uh, living there on many occasions, staying there overnight. Wow. And they witnessed and documented perhaps the full panoply of paranormal activity. There were apparitions. The, the key and most bizarre thing were the voices. After a few weeks, uh, one of the, the, the girls who was seen to be the center of the, the activity, it, it was more intense when she was around started to, uh, at first of all, make barking, dog barking noises that didn't seem to be coming from her normal, you know, from her mouth. Mm -hmm. Then she began to speak in the voice of an elderly man. Now the SPR thought, that obviously they thought, well, she's playing along. So they called upon a speech therapist and a professional ventriloquist in order to uh, examine both the noises, the voices, not just recordings, whilst they were actually taking place. Mm -hmm. And they deduced that th this girl could not have been producing these voices by any normal means. And yet conversations exist between the investigators and the voice which identified itself as Bill, which described uh, details of his life, which were later verifiable, details of his death, which were later verifiable, and a whole in, there's a whole interesting discourse and conversation with the spirit. The, the, the spirit voices lasted for many, many, many weeks. And indeed, one of the, the other daughter also started to produce them, although not as uh, 
clearly. Mm -hmm. But the elder daughter, Janet, certainly um, could, or, or Bill was certainly speaking through Janet. In a, it, I think the effect was described as beneath our normal vocal cords, we have a, a second set of uh, auxiliary flat uh, vocal cords called false vocal cords. Now, you can actually talk with them, but it leaves you, after a few moments, hoarse and with a sore throat. And yet you have Janet supposed, supposedly uh, speaking in this fashion for over an hour in some instances. Mm. Right. Now, we ha the SPR have the full uh, set of recordings. And um, indeed, on Monday night, I've been able to access some of them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. including a 12-minute interview with the poltergeist. Oh, wow. But it, it set fire to things, it poured water on things. Ooh. On one occasion, it ripped a 60-pound cast-iron gas fire surround out of the wall. And the skeptics like Nickel and others all claimed, oh, it's the work of the girls. Mm. Now, mm, absolutely, on one occasion, the girls decided to prank. There was an investigator who they didn't like very much, and they <laughs> decided to prank the investigator. Uh -huh. And they went into the kitchen, and they they were obviously up to something, uh, and it's it's recorded by by one of the, by uh, Maurice Grossi, one of the investigators. It, he could see they were doing so up to something, so he was keeping a close eye on the two <laughs> girls, because they were obviously be, you know being conspiratorial plotting. and giggling and plotting, and then a spoon got thrown in the kitchen, and they were oh Mr. Gross, do come and have a look. There's a spoon been thrown. <laughs> and he said, I just saw you do it. Why did I do it? <laughs> that was the basis of an awful lot of people turning around and saying uh, they did everything else. Uh, when a great deal of it happened when they weren't there mm -hmm. um, and, and couldn't possibly have been involved. But there were 30 or 40 independent witnesses from mm -hmm. police officers through to innocent passerbys who, didn't re who were later interviewed. Did the SPR do any work with uh, mediums, in other words, investigating mediums, or that type of claims? Or the SPR, SPR as a body has no corporate uh, view. Uh, they also don't have the facilities to investigate or test mediums. and that's Because I know like Harry Price was involved a little yeah. bit working well, that with was Well, that was Harry Price set up the National, National Laboratory, Laboratory yeah. for Psychical Research. But he was, wasn't he involved with the SPR? He was, was a member yeah. of the, the society, but yeah. then he, he left and formed the NLPR. Yeah. The society doesn't have its own laboratories or research facilities, but it does put a lot of funding and resources into, the, uh, into universities that do. And a lot of SPR members like Dr. Cooper uh, and others, um, they they study these the the idea of mediumship and consciousness and psi, uh, these uh, super abilities that people claim. So the SPR uh, fund an awful lot of research projects, but they themselves, their members do, uh, funded by and independently of the SPR. Hmm. Is there a lot of uh, paranormal research or paranormal studies being done in universities in, in uh, England? There is some being done. There is notably two uh, academic research groups. Uh, there, are other, there are several other universities that have smaller teams of interested people. But y at Northampton, you have uh, a department for anomalous psychology, they call it, and that's where Cal works. And then there is an older one um, up at Edinburgh University, which was has been going since the 1970s, called the Kersler, uh, what we call it, the Kersler Laboratory, uh, the Kersler Lab. It's probably that's th the name's incorrect, but it was that was actually founded uh, uh, of a bequest from Arthur Kersler, who was an, uh, an SP one of the SPR members. How do you become an SPR member? You just join. Just join. You just join. They'll give me your money. They'll happily uh. <laughs> give me your money, and you're there. Yeah, I'm I mean a member of the Ghost Club. This is the thing, people, and and this was why I I ranted at the SPR because they'd given off this impression that you had to be, you know, sort of aloof and elite and wear corduroy with leather patches <laughs> on your arm and um, and have penny round glasses in order to become a member. But no, absolutely anybody can become a member of the Society right. for Science. Anywhere in the world. We have members right. all over the Rick world. Rick Hale is a member, right? Uh, we have members all over the world. And indeed, the conferences are attended by people from all over the world. 
and though all of those people accessing the hard library um, which has several thousand books in it might be more difficult because in the UK we can post them in and out mm -hmm. and there's no charge mm -hmm. um, but the online uh, library um, which is truly comprehensive is available to every member free of charge Ooh. where you can download huge chunks of information wow there you go folks yep so become a member sign up send them your money it's yeah. not even expensive i mean there are, there are levels cheap <laughs> well what's 35 35 dollars it's not that much for a year uh, is it really that's pretty reasonable for the sbi yeah oh. yeah i thought there was a hundred and some odd oh uh, interesting yeah <laughs> Uh, it depends which level of membership you've you yeah, accessed. Exactly. If you right. have an associate membership, it will cost you less than a good steak dinner. All right. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. So okay. then you could put it on your resume and look like you're somebody. Well, Very that's important. one of the problems <laughs> that we've tried to address. Because what we have noticed in, in recent years um, is that people join just to say, I'm a member of the SPR. Exactly. Like a badge of accreditation. Like you're a doctor. <laughs> and this yeah, year, yeah, the exactly. SPR are... Uh, the guidance notes, which we talked about earlier, are literally only the very first step of a rolling program. Uh, later this year, the go-ahead, the green light has just been given to a ghost hunting investigators training course um, run by the SPR. Really? That's lovely. And who uh, would be involved in that? Whoever wants to be. Yeah. It, it will be open and available. Well, who was designing the course is what I'm saying. Uh, they gave the, the job to me. Uh, how did ah. I know that? <laughs> um, but, but most, but most for those who don't know, Steve is, is also uh, written another book called Ghostology, which is uh, a lot bigger than 65-page uh, guidance it's notes. It's on 300 pages. Yes, exactly, <laughs> and, and it goes into a lot of uh, the ghost uh, hunting techniques and so forth. And um, it's a it's a good book to check it out. It's it's on Amazon. They're I both believe. all th uh, the we all three books: Ghostology, Paracoustics, and uh, the SPR Guidance. They're all mm -hmm. available on Amazon.com. Um, dead easy to find Excellent. because of their ridiculously lurid covers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sensible books with very silly covers. In yeah. fact, Ghostology also has a um, a word search in the back of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a dare in a personality <laughs> thing because you, you just worked your way through 300 pages of, you know, there's, it's not heavy, but, and I thought I had one page left over. Oh, well. So I, I thought I'm going to poke fun at the, pub, at the publisher. Mm. So I stuck a, a paranormal word search <laughs> on the back page. So the next one will have a little Ouija board in the back? <laughs> Somebody suggested we could have a, a, a cut out and fold uh, K2 meter. <laughs> that works too. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, there's I mean, I. Funny about Ouija boards, kids' books. W I've got a Barnes and Noble book from the 80s, mm -hmm. and it's about investigating haunted houses, and it's got a pull-out Ouija board. Oh, oh my! It's designed for f ages four and up. Four? Ah, for kids. It Here's a Ouija board. It was there you go. Yeah, Have it fun. It was only on the I market. I always love <laughs> the one. It's a, it's fake, but they used to have the Ouija board Happy Meal. For McDonald's. Oh my God! You're uh, kidding? No, it was it, the it coolest was, it thing. It was a spoof. Uh, it was oh. a spoof. That's what I said. It wasn't real, but uh, I absolutely loved it. I wish McDonald's would do it. I'd be the first in line <laughs> to get this silly thing. Funnily <laughs> enough, uh, there was this. It was somebody mocked up a picture yeah. of a of a Happy Meal, a Happy Meal box mm. that came with the free. Oh, 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 oh it was okay. folded so cool. out into yeah. a Ouija board. Yeah, That's a it was really cool. That's well, in the UK, I've now got one. Because somebody went ahead and, and made, actually made, that made a limited <laughs> edition run of Happy Meal boxes <laughs> that fold out into a Ouija board and the it. planchettes inside. That's awesome. Uh, shaped like um, a hash brown. So, <laughs> you know, y the next step, of course, would be, uh, you know, cereal boxes with the old recordings on the back like they used to have. It would be EVP recordings from... You know, Ma Mike should do that, speaker. right? Yeah, a little Mike. Speaker Mike and his what? EVPs, Massachusetts. Is that the name of his book. What's the name of Mike? Uh, ghostly Voices. EVP Ghostly. Yes, voices. Mike should do that. Contact the serial company, and we'll <laughs> put a little uh, disc like they used to do in the old time. <laughs> and uh, there you go. What kind of serial should be? Little little ghosties. Well, little can't, can't be count Chocula. Demons and. Booberry, of course. <laughs> Booberry. <laughs>
Funny you should Perfect. talk about that. Do you remember the action man where you pulled the string and he t he, he gave out several commands? Uh, G.I. Joe, sorry. It's called yeah. Action oh, Man yeah. in the UK. Yeah. And he had a string on the back and he yeah. wrote, Over Rastaz the hill, man, and run away. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Rastaz won somewhere. Well, there is, uh, I encountered one on an investigation. A talking one? A talking G.I. Joe. Oh. Mm. And what they did was they'd, um, they pulled the cord mm -hmm. and then the Action Man would speak, the G.I. Joe, um, would speak the words of the ghost. You oh. die. You are so, gonna so die. That, and oh. so they were claiming, but of course, when you pull the cord, it unwinds the clockwork mechanism, which has got a small piece of tape inside mm -hmm. it, um, and it was all pre-recorded on the tape. Mm. God bless them for trying. Oh God, that's great. But they had people, you know, for a while, people on their public ghost that were going, "Oh my God, the action man said." <laughs> I mean, it had great, uh, great one lines in it, like, you will die, uh -huh. leave this place. Mm -hmm. They'd all been pre-recorded. Mm -hmm. Oh. Listen to, <laughs> yeah, well, listen to the psychic. Listen to the psychic. We just got the rap cue already. Cool. It Don't. just flew by. Don't. So what, uh, if someone wants to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, I'm a, f well, uh, <laughs> If you go to theghosthunter.webs.com, okay. uh, you can find me there, or awesome. you can find me on Facebook. Yes. Or if you want to get to the SPR, mm -hmm. if you want to find out more about the SPR, it's www, obviously, spr.ac.uk, spr.ac.uk. Excellent, excellent. And how long are you here for, t Steve? Another week. Another week. Lovely. Get, you've got this, uh, Event Brexit permitting. You got this. <laughs> uh, you got this event on Friday here in uh, Whitman. Yep. And then Monday you have dining with the dead. And you're also doing a Harry Price ghost hunt, which unfortunately is also. I'm really awesome. looking forward to the Whitman one because um, when ghosts attack, it's one of those. Um, it's it's a favorite talk of mine. Excellent. We well, want to thank well, you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, and Steve. Coming five thousand miles just to do this show. Just to see us. <laughs> Till next time. All Good right. night. God bless. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next month. From goalies to ghosties, long leggedy beasties, and things that go bump in the night. Deliver us, good Lord.